So this will be a pretty quick spin. Um, we're going to talk about a video that our office produced at NCAR UCAR about a year ago, and it was in conjunction with the debut of a, our Atmos News website. And I failed to put this on the screen, but I'll tweet it when we're done with the session. Uh, our Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and uh, web presences are all Atmos News, A-T-M-O-S-N-E-W-S. Um, this presentation is uh, in collaboration with Matt Hirschland, who's just left NCAR, unfortunately, um, but sends his regards. and. Uh, um, I know this was one of the, his most enjoyable projects while he was with us at NCAR. As you all know, metaphors are power. Uh, we use them all the time. This one is almost literally, as well as metaphorically, power. Um, uh, many of you probably know this one from Wally, Wally Broker. Uh, it appeared at an uh, exhibit about three, four years ago. Climate is an angry beast, and we are poking at it with sticks. Climate change can be viewed as a detective story, with the scientists uh, out there being a climate detectives. You can view Earth as a, a, a patient in need of, of a diagnosis, and it's up to the climate scientists to be the planet doctors. Uh, many, many other examples, of course. Uh, and so folks have done some nice cataloging of the various metaphors. Um, but I think a metaphor has to fulfill two requirements. As you've all heard from John Cook's talk on Saturday night, and many of you know in your own practice, uh, you need to be sticky. You need to make sure that whatever metaphor you use resonates. And these are the principles of stickiness. Uh, for those of you that weren't there on Saturday night, I wasn't myself. Uh, it needs to be simple. You need a little element of surprise. Uh, but it also needs to be something concrete that you can grab onto. Uh, of course, credible. Uh, there has to be some emotionality and some form of narrative in there for it to be the most effective. And these uh, come courtesy of the book Made to Stick uh, by Chip Heath and Dan Heath. Um, but I think it also, uh, metaphors need to be apt as well. You know, they really have to carry the weight of some, some content uh, to really be effective. Now, how many people in here recognize this image? It's from a public service ad. Uh, not very many. Oh, interesting. Uh, this came out in 2006, and I, I unfortunately couldn't find the ad on YouTube or anywhere else. Uh, it was a good example of the kind of fear-based communication that was out or, around this time, and we've since learned that the fear is not necessarily the best motivator uh, or even necessarily the best way for people to remember information. Um, but it, it came out, um, Environmental Defense and Ad Council, pretty big splash. And I'm using it not really to critique the ad. Um, I would point out that it reminds me of an ad that came out in 1964, uh, the LBJ famous uh, little girl uh, playing with the flower, and then uh, there's a nuclear explosion. So I think the little girl in Jeopardy meme uh, has, has been going for a long time. Um, what I found interesting, just in looking up to see if there was anything current on the web about this, I found a dialogue between uh, train advocates uh, that were upset about this video. And uh, an ad council representative said, uh, consumers understand it's a metaphor that the girl is not really being hit by a train. And one of the advocates responded, do you not recognize how environmentally friendly trains are? <laughs> Your commercial makes our railroads look like an evil entity. And I have to confess, I never thought of that. So I think this is a good example of how metaphors can you run off the rails for certain audiences, and you may not even realize it. But um, boom Sorry. <laughs> it is a session about humor, right? even if it's bad. <laughs> um, well, in terms of apt metaphors, you know, there are surprisingly few, I think, to capture the, the essence of the climate system. And one I've always liked is the loaded dice one. I've always attributed it to Steve Schneider, and he would probably attribute it to people before him, but I know he made a lot of use of it uh, to very good effect. Now, what is it that makes this a strong metaphor? Uh, it's probabilistic, for one thing. And uh, when we started our website about a year ago, we wanted to similarly find another metaphor for probabilism, because uh, the package of articles that we created for this debut was on attribution. And uh, one of the keystones of climate attribution is coming up with uh, statements about probabilistic uh, outcomes. If we do X to climate, then Y may happen to a certain type of weather or climate event. And I think those are really important concepts to get across. They're challenging to do succinctly, so we created a set of articles, including a, an event spectrum, uh, showing the likelihood that certain types of phenomena were closely related or less closely related to climate change. Uh, we had an um, attribution spectrum, which talked about the different types of attribution approaches that were out there. But we wanted something a little bit lighter to kind of catch people's attention. And a uh, scientist at NCAR named Jerry Meal had been using the analogy of steroids in the climate system. And I know it precedes Jerry. And the, as far as I've been able to trace it back, was actually here at the meeting uh, talking to Amanda from National Wildlife Federation, who says it was used in 2007? 2008, I just found it. Oh, 2008, OK. So at least five years back. So Jerry has used it a lot um, when talking about some work he did uh, in conjunction with the Weather Channel, looking at record highs and record lows. 
and some of you may be familiar with this, a paper that came out in 2009 and some follow-up work, uh, simply looking at um, how many daily record highs and daily record lows have been set in the United States for the last, uh, I think, 60 years. And the, the nut of the story is that it's increased every decade. The ratio of highs to lows has increased for the last several decades. And in the 2000s, it was about 2 to 1. It's been more like 3 to 1 the last several years. Uh, last year, I think it ended up being 9 to 1 or, or something like that. This year, interestingly, it's pretty close to, flat, to level. Uh, we'll see how long that lasts. But uh, the analogy actually accommodates that sort of behavior. So what I like about this analogy is, again, it's probabilistic. Uh, one especially strong point is it talks about a, a component of the system that's natural. You know, we have steroid chemicals in our bodies. We're injecting ourselves with them that makes us behave in a way that's not normal or not natural. So likewise, if you inject the climate system with CO2, which is a natural ingredient, you, you make it behave strangely. And it also allows room for counterintuitive results, like what's happening this year with the highs and lows balance. It's also fairly sticky, I think. Um, it's simple, it's concrete, uh, there's emotion involved. I think when we were coming up with this design, uh, Carly Calvin, our designer, showed us the first draft and we all kind of went, <laughs> um, But, you know, uh, it's also a narrative, as you'll see when I show you this uh, two-minute video in just a sec. So this is the package. Uh, the easiest way to find it, and we'll, I'll tweet the URL, but just Google baseball, steroids, and climate change, and it should come up. Uh, there's also about five or six articles with it. Uh, Jerry was our narrator for uh, his portion of the segment. Uh, Noah Besser from Parker Street um, an Animation Firm in Fort Collins. They've done great work with a, a um, weather observing network, a volunteer network called Coco Ross. Uh, it has something like 10,000 people around the country doing daily weather observations. So we liked his style and uh, uh, contracted with him to do this production. Uh, Matt and I and Genia, our writer-editor, uh, fantastic, also our, our web guru and uh, social media guru in our office, and Carly, our web designer. So we worked over a period of several months to put this together. It was published in February, and uh, I'd just like to show it. Hope we have sound. What do steroids in baseball have in common with climate change? Well, imagine a baseball player who's been taking steroids. This baseball player steps to the plate and hits a home run. And yes, the question, was that home run due to the steroids? If you look at the number of home runs he hits over a season when he's taking steroids, and compare that to a previous season when he wasn't taking steroids, it is only then that you can figure out that the steroids have made him more able to hit home run because it's made him stronger, and the chances of him hitting home run are greater. So by adding just a little bit more to those naturally occurring steroids in the human body, we change the background base state of our systems. Okay, got it. But a lot of bad things happen when you take steroids, right? The greenhouse gases that we're adding to the atmosphere from the burning of fossil fuels are the steroids of the climate system. The atmosphere has very small amounts of greenhouse gases that occur naturally. So by adding just a little bit more of those greenhouse gases by the burning of fossil fuels to the air, we change the background state of the climate system. We increase the temperatures just a little bit, but that increase of temperatures is enough to shift the odds toward a much greater chance for extreme heat events and extreme precipitation events. Normally, you'd expect record lows and record highs to balance out over time, but now we're getting almost three record highs for every record low. So just as a baseball player on steroids can occasionally strike out, you're out. climate system with increased greenhouse gases can still experience record cold temperatures. But the chances of record high temperatures are still much greater. And that's what steroids in baseball have to do with climate change. To find out more about climate change and extreme weather, check out ucar.edu slash atmosnews. So uh, that's the product. Uh, thank you, guys. Um, this is the closing. So um, I would say I know the first two questions that are going to come up are um, audience and metrics. And audience is, um, I'd say, pretty close to, to your audience, Peter. Um, a fair amount of uh, science-interested people, uh, media certainly. Um, I, I wouldn't say congressional staffers. There, there might be some in, in the mix. But, um, uh, you know, those are the folks that we have traditionally communicated with. And this was for a revamp of our website, our news website. So um, we did get about 60,000 views as of now on YouTube. So. Uh, Maybe it's chopped liver, but nice chopped liver. You know. <laughs> um, 
uh, some interest in mainstream media. We were gratified about that. We were also gratified that uh, we got quoted in the formal literature. Uh, the State of the Climate Report in BAMS in 2011 didn't make reference to it. We really do need metrics. I would love to be able to do a thorough study of especially how this affected people's attitudes and behaviors. You know, um, I think generally people hopefully found it entertaining, but you know what? Did it, did it stick? Did the message stick? Did it make them more interested in finding out more? I think these are all great questions, and uh, uh, it would be good to find out more. And I'm still interested in other metaphors of this ilk that are um, both apt and sticky, so hopefully in the Q&A we can talk more about that. So um, thank you. <laughs>